right, so this is my list of film directors ranked worst to best. This time, this time around, it's Martin Scorsese's films ranked worst to best. I've done other videos such as like Tim Burton, David Fincher, David Lynch. Check them out down below. But for now, Scorsese, let's get into it. So firstly, let me just give the rules. So I'm not doing any documentaries that he did or any short films. This is specifically theatrical films, full length that are non-documentary. So he's done 24 of them. So I'm going to rank them from 24 to 1, with obviously the first being the best, in my opinion, of course. So number four my mistake, not four, 24, is New York, New York, and that stars Robert De Niro, which is his favorite collaborator. You'll hear me mention his name a lot. Robert De Niro is in this film, and he plays a musician who's very egotistical. It's a film that is very lackadaisy with its storytelling. Um, it's very, very much so based on improv, which I get, but at the same time, it was way too long. It was almost three hours. It's an okay film. It's a film that you won't really remember, and it's hard to find, too, but it's an okay film. Number 23 is Who's That Knocking at My Door? This was Scorsese's first film, Black and White, Harvey Keitel. Rock-solid film. It falls right in the middle of his filmmaking style being really good to also being just borderline still in process. And I think that's one of the reasons why, while watching the film, I was like, okay, I can see certain elements of his that can be blossomed into further you know, being the director that we know as today. But with this film, it's still growing, and it's it's not a film that's really aged well, in my opinion. It's a solid film, though, for sure. Number 22 is the sequel to The Hustler, and that's The Color of Money. So The Color of Money is a rock-solid film as well. It's a film that, at first glance, you wouldn't think Scorsese would direct because it's a sequel, first of all. He doesn't really do sequels. And at the same time, it's also a film that, when you're watching it, it doesn't really feel like a Scorsese film because... The editing, the cinematography, everything's not as great as his other films usually are. It's a solid filmmaking piece for sure, but at the same time, it feels very subdued for him. Uh, there's not that much language, even though it is rated R. It's just an overall film that it's solid because of the acting, but as a whole, you won't really remember it too much, especially when comparing it to The Hustler, which was a great movie. Uh, number 21 is, it almost feels like a sequel to Taxi Driver. And that's Bringing Out the Dead. Ironically, Paul Schrader wrote that film, as well as this film. And it stars Nicolas Cage. And it's a good film in terms of dealing with paramedics and the procedures that ensue with that. I would recommend this film, uh, specifically because Nicolas Cage and Patricia Arquette are incredible in this film. The messages are also very interesting, I found personally. So I would definitely recommend it. And it's, it's a rock-solid film, which is why it's at number 21. Number 20 is the film that... I would argue put him on the map in terms of filmmaking, and that is Mean Streets. Mean Streets was a film where people watched it and they kind of realized, hey, this isn't the best gangster film, but there's potential to be had with this director. And of course, you know, he made one of the, you know, arguably best gangster films. We'll get to that towards the end. But um, yeah, Mean Streets is a rock solid film. It, it, it's a, again, a film that you watch it, you see elements of the Scorsese that we later see and learned and loved. So that is, of course, my number 20. My number 19 is Boxcar Bertha. I honestly think that this film is very underrated because it's a film that, yes, it's simple, and yes, it doesn't really have a lot to show for it, but that final act, it really does build to, in my opinion, a finale that was really, really interesting. I would definitely recommend Boxcar Bertha. Number 18 is the film that was really good during its time, and I still think it has aged very well in certain aspects, and that's Ellen Burstyn's passion project, which is called Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. So Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore is a rock-solid film. It was a film that really did dedicate itself to being focused on the 70s and that aesthetic of feminism, and I think it worked to that level, especially given her all. Ellen Burstyn did a great job in this film, and I would definitely say the film is worth watching for her performance alone. Now we get to a film that is on the complete end of the spectrum, and that's After Hours. This is an easy breezy film that is very entertaining, that as you're watching it, you're kind of realizing that at only 98 minutes, I believe it is, it goes by so fast and it's so worth watching, specifically for the performances. And yeah, I would recommend it. Number 16 is a film that when it came out, it really did show Scorsese's ability to adapt to different genres, and that's The Age of Innocence. So Age of Innocence is a film with Daniel Day-Lewis, Michelle Pfeiffer, period piece, 
a film that you really would not think Scorsese would touch, but again, he's ambitious. He's all about testing his filmmaking style. And he did. I mean, Age of Innocence is not a great movie, in my opinion. It's a film that's rock solid with great performances. It's a little bit too long, if you ask me. But at the end of the day, it's a film that when you're watching it, you're watching it for the costumes. You're watching it for the acting. And on those fronts, it, it does a great job, in my opinion. But again, not a perfect film. Another film, obviously, is number 15, and that's Cape Fear. So this is a film that's a remake. And how does it compare to the original? Well, that's another video for another day. But overall, I think it was a solid film that is held together by Robert De Niro's electrifying performance. He's incredible in the film. It's what got him an Oscar nomination, honestly. I mean, he was great in it. So, so sublime. The next performance... Um, that, well, I don't want to say performance. It's a film that really, really is underrated, and that's Kundin. So Kundin is a film that, when you first think about it, it really is a film that should get more attention than it already does. Because it's a film that is focused on religion and a specific time period during this reign of a king. And I think that when you watch the film and you realize that it's really not focused on actors, it's focused on people that just went on set and we're just given the direction by Scorsese, it's really good on that front because it's hard enough to act you know, from actors, but from non-professional actors, they did a pretty good job. And it's a technical achievement too. It's gorgeous to look at with the costume design, the production design, and the score by Philip Glass is electrifying. It's really, really provocative. It's a really good film that I would say is very, very underrated personally. And number 13 is a film that Daniel Day-Lewis gives it his all. Daniel Day-Lewis as Bill the Butcher for Gangs of New York. Outstanding performance. Solid film. I know I've been saying solid a lot, but uh, until we get to, like, I'd say the next one, his films are solid, in my opinion. They're all solid from 13 down to 24. But 13 is what really kind of, to me, showed that Scorsese, it's all about the material he's given. Because Gangs of New York, I do want to rewatch it, just throwing it out there. My opinion could change with this film. But for right now, I think it's a film that you look at everything from the acting, it's solid acting. But when you look at Daniel Day-Lewis compared to those, you're like, oh my goodness, Daniel Day-Lewis is magnetic. He's incredible. One of the best performances of the 20th century. I mean, 21st century, my mistake. But... Everyone else compared to him, he makes everyone else look like they're not even good at acting. And that's kind of crazy because when you're watching the movie, you want Bill the Butcher to be on screen even more than he is. But there's a romance to be had. And in my opinion, they should have focused more on the villain because he was incredible. But I get why they didn't. I really do. But it's still a film that I want to rewatch. It's a little long, but at the same time, I'm not going to lie, when I did see it, it did hail my attention the entire time. Next up, number 12 is a film that... I respect it technically. Um, it's kind of like Hunted where it's a film that kids can watch, but I don't think they're going to fully appreciate it. And that's called Hugo. Hugo is a throwback, a callback to the silent era pictures. It's a film that you're watching and it just washes over you with the visual flourishes that are to be had. It's a lot of nostalgic material, but it's nostalgic material not for the sake of being nostalgic. It's actually given audiences grasp to material that they wouldn't have otherwise known about. I mean, it's focusing on the silent era. Let's be honest. There's not much nostalgia to be had unless someone gives it to you and actually says, hey, look, you don't know much about this. So here it is. Here's what we're going to let you know and inform you about. And I think that's what good nostalgia actually can come about a film like Hugo. Again, kind of like Gangs of New York. I do want to rewatch it. But yeah, that's why it's number 12. It's a good film that I, I do want to rewatch. Number 11 is the film that heavily, heavily inspired Nightcrawler and also The Joker, the Joker movie that's coming out in October of this year, and that's King of Comedy. The King of Comedy, I didn't realize how much it inspired a lot of films, but having seen it recently, I was like, oh my goodness, Nightcrawler took heavily from this in a good way, obviously. Uh, the King of Comedy is Robert De Niro's Toy Force performance. Jerry Lewis is also in it, and he's incredible. It's a film that... For comedy being in the title, it's not as funny as you would want it to be. But at the same time, it's a great story, great acting, and well, well paced. I would highly recommend it. Now we get into my top 10 for Scorsese's films. So number 10 is a film that very, very controversial uh, when it first came out back in 2013. It's, it's a good film. I do think it falls apart in the end, and that's The Wolf of Wall Street. 
I like this film. I I don't love it the way a lot of people do because again, I do think there are some tonal issues. And um, excuse me, gotta get a little water. There are some tonal issues for sure. It is a bit excessive, which is the whole point of the film. But with its tonal issues, I get what they were going for. But it was still imbalanced. And for me, imbalanced films they're tough to watch because upon rewatch, you kind of are able to pinpoint the fact that it is imbalanced and. I don't know, for me, it dampers that whole feeling, that whole uh, immersive experience for me personally. But it's still a good film. It's got great performances all around. It's very funny and clever. And uh, yeah, I would recommend it. It's a good script. Next up is number nine, which is the film that every Scorsese fanboy jerks off to. I personally, it's a, it's a, it's a good film. It's good. Hence the title of Goodfellas. Goodfellas, I'm not going to lie, I, I think it's good, but I don't know. I mean, I respect it because it heavily influenced a movie like Boogie Nights, which is one of my all-time favorites, but I don't know. Goodfellas, it's a good movie, yeah, it's got great performances, it's got an interesting story for sure, it's got clever uh, visual flourishes, the cinematography is great, but there are just certain aspects of it that, I, again, kind of like The Wolf of Wall Street, which many people say... Uh, the Wolf of Washington was heavily influenced by Goodfellas, which makes sense because this film also just kind of falls apart towards the end. It gets less interesting, especially with the ending. But again, that's just all my opinion. Uh, again, I respect Goodfellas, though. Truly, I do. Next up is the film that was influenced by Goodfellas and in return influenced The Wolf of Wall Street, and that's Casino. Very long film, but it never drags. It keeps you interested. Sharon Stone is fantastic in the movie. Joe Pesci is great in it, and Robert De Niro is also in it. It's a, it's a good movie. Um, I like it a little bit more than Goodfellas, obviously. That's why it's my number eight. But it's a film that also has the same flaws of Goodfellas and Wolf of Wall Street. It falls apart towards the end, right as it should be uh, building momentum and being excellent. It just it kind of dampers out towards the end. And it's a shame, really, because, again, it's a good film. I think it does warrant its three-hour runtime. It's just a film that I don't think is fantastic. Next up is um, also in this whole three pack, and that's The Aviator. Another long film, but it tells a true life story of um, Howard Hughes. And my goodness, the art direction, aka production design in this film, is fantastic. The costume design, the score by Howard Shore, the acting by Kate Blanchett, uh, Kate Beckinsale, Leonardo DiCaprio, everyone is great in the film. Scorsese also makes um, two hours and I believe it's 58 minutes breeze by really fast. Uh, the crash sequence in the film is also very, very well handled. The visual effects are incredible. It's a film that I would definitely say that film buffs might be able to appreciate more than just your average Joe. But it's still a film I would recommend to everyone because it is a well-made film. Uh, next up is a film that actually this was this was his most recent film, but it, it really... It really affected me, man. And that's uh, number six is Silence. This film stars Adam Driver and it also stars Andrew Garfield, Liam Neeson. It's a film that it's a thought provoking film. It's about religion, dissecting it, showing the positives and negatives of it and not giving answers to these moral, ambiguous questions that Scorsese is asking. It's a film that it's a shame that when it came out in 2016, no one really talked about it. It, it didn't make any money. Critics liked it, but it just didn't really build. On top of that, it's only got nominated for one Oscar. And that was for cinematography, which, yeah, it was earned. But it's just a film that overall, it's a shame that it didn't get as much attention that it should have, in my opinion, received. Next up is the film that it won Best Picture, finally, as well as Best Director. And it's a remake of Infernal Affairs, which was a good movie. It was a good Hong Kong film. But that is The Departed, which is a good film. The first time I saw it, I thought it was just solid. But upon rewatching it, I do like it a lot better. I think it is a perfectly paced film. It maintains its ability to entertain throughout. And on top of that, it's got a killer ending with many twists and turns that you don't see coming as well as attention to detail. Like, if you notice, there are many scenes where there'll be X's in the back that simply just show that there are people that are about to die. Like, if you notice, there are scenes, again, I'm not going to spoil it, but there are scenes that in the back will show X's right before a character will die. Something fascinating, a little tidbit that I recommend, you know, upon rewatching, 
to kind of notice it because it's something I noticed that I really appreciate it. Next up is number three. This is a film that a lot of people, it's either Goodfellas or this movie that a lot of people have as their number one. Me personally, it's my number three. It's Taxi Driver. Another film that heavily influenced uh, Nightcrawler, also influenced Drive, You Were Never Really Here, and it's why I respect it so much. It's also a tour de force for Robert De Niro. In my opinion, it's a film that could have slash would have won Best Picture in 1976, but of course Rocky came out and a lot of people had a hard on for that movie. I guess I can understand, but Taxi Driver, it's just, it's a hard film to watch. It's very depressing, it's grueling, it's slow paced, but it has a point to it because it lets the imagery wash over you and you're able to fully think about all that's happening. I love it for that. <laughs> That's my Taxi Driver's number three. My number two is one of the films I've seen recently off his, and I fully respected the heck out of this film. In fact, I'll be honest, it almost reached my number one. It was a back and forth. But my number two is The Last Temptation of Christ. Holy cow. This film was brilliant. Absolutely bonkers in terms of brilliance. It really got under my skin at how brilliant this film was. It's not even a film I want to really talk about, the actual premise and everything I loved about it. It's just a film that I want to say, go out of your way and watch this film because it is mind-blowingly fantastic. A lot of things that, yes, when it came out were controversial, but it makes sense as to why it was in the film. And not only that, it's a film that after you're done watching it, you're able to say, wow, Scorsese is able to direct a film like this, but then also a film like Goodfellas. Mind-blowing. Watch The Last Temptation of Christ. Please, please. And now, the one you guys have all been waiting for, my number one. You guys have probably already realized it if, you know, if you've been keeping track. But it's um, Raging Bull. Uh, it's the film that won Robert De Niro his second Oscar. It's the film that should have won uh, Best Picture. I believe it won over, I mean, my mistake, Ordinary People, I believe, was what won over Raging Bull. How? I don't know, to be honest. I really don't. Raging Bull is a, a fantastic film. It's the true life story of Jake LaMotta. It's filmed in black and white, which, you know, Scorsese played around with in other films on this list. But I think Raging Bull is his best film because there's a true reasoning as to why it's shot in black and white. And it's to really show that this character isn't simply black and white. He is a very morally great character that you... you you're entertained by because some of the things he does are so outlandish, but happen in real life. But at the same time, you can see why he's as a character, just very, very morally bankrupt. <laughs> but there are elements to him that also make him interesting. And that's why he's just one of those characters, like almost like an anti-hero, that I fully, fully respect as a film, as to why Scorsese chose to do it. And that's why it's my number one. Now, guys, that was my personal list of Scorsese's films ranked. I want to know your guys' personal list of Scorsese's films ranked. Um, I know mine seems kind of random with some of these choices, but trust me, it took me a while to pick out these films, and it's the order that I did. Um, again, there wasn't a single one of his films where I was like, that was terrible. All of his films, even his films that I consider his worst, were just okay. As a whole, though, I always like to say at the end of my reviews of directors, I think Scorsese is a film director that I like. He is a film director that has a lot of visual flourishes that are fantastic. His films are always well shot. They always sound good. They have fantastic performances. I'm always looking forward to when he makes the next film. He's making The Irishman, which is coming out on Netflix later on this year. Very excited for it because, again, I've seen all his films now. I think he's a good director. I think that if you're going to start with one of his films, start with my number one. Raging Bull is a film that I feel like anyone can watch and appreciate because it's it's fantastic filmmaking. But uh, Scorsese, my book, he gets a he gets a good rating. He gets a good rating from me. But guys, Scorsese, again, let me know your ranking list. Let me know in the comment section below from worst to best your list and any directors that you want me to you know actually fully break down their films and like from, you know, worst to best. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below of any potential candidates. And next up, I will be doing either Paul Thomas Anderson or, of course, Stanley Kubrick. So look out for those reviews, guys. And as always, thank you much for watching. And I'll hit, don't forget the subscription, notification bell, and I'll uh, catch you guys later.